Well, welcome back. So, uh, in addition to this being kind of U.S. China and architects and engineers, we thought we'd do something really radical and have it to the Stanford and Berkeley. So, uh, so we actually have two Berkeley folks on the program, and, and I'll start out. I'm really delighted to uh, welcome Renee Childs, who's a professor of uh, architecture at UC Berkeley. Uh, recently, wrote a book called uh, Changing Chinese Cities. And I think what she'll be talking about is more kind of this aspect of it. these tall buildings and how they affect the urbanism. So, I think it's well I'm an urban designer, um, I research urban fabrics. I'm very interested in Midwest urbanism. And I said, Are you sure you want me? And he said, Yes, please come. So I'm going to preface it with that um, and say that I'm going to start my talk by asking a particular question that I use as a lens when I walk around cities. And that is, what are the roles of tall buildings in cities? I start with the more, most depressing picture we'll see for the day. Um, today's urbanism and development are based on a 20th century paradigm that was intended to solve the urgent problems of that time, and that was urban health and safety. Older cities were overcrowded with poor sanitation as well as lack of daylight and ventilation. The revolutionary solution of the time was light, air, separated uses, and it was founded on certain premises. The aggregation of large amounts of capital wealth, the emergence of new vertical and horizontal technologies, in particular the elevator and the private automobile, and the assumptions of limitless resources, both material and energy. This paradigm is offered as a universal how do we Rasa approach to all of our urban ills? While debates over what constitutes good cities emerged and continue to this day, the allure of tall, object-like buildings grew. The design and development culture emerged, dominated by icons that expressed government, corporate, or individual identity, subsuming the identities of places. <laughs> In Glear's New York, Rem Koolhaas is coming back again, um, he penned the term auto monument, describing how a building of a certain mass, disaggregated from its context, becomes a landmark of the public realm, even if it holds no activities tied to civic symbolism. So Koolhaas, the purest manifestation of the auto monument is the skyscraper. On the jacket of the book, he describes New York as being in its terminal stage of urbanism. So it sounds like cancer when auto monuments dominate the city. My parents are Shanghainese, so I'm okay picking on Shanghai. Um, this legacy of 20th century um, urbanism has led to the fragmentation of urban fabrics, and in some cases, a homogenization of experiences within and between cities. Today, we face new urban challenges. We need density, diversity, equity, and we all know we need to reduce resource consumption in light of global environmental degradation. These challenges require us to rethink the underlying assumptions of our urban design paradigms top-down, capital-intensive approaches need to support bottom-up initiatives. Resources are not limitless, but need to be conserved. Technologies and systems need to be advanced for collective and public good. Should we continue to use the same tall building paradigm developed in the 20th century? The rich and complex ways that we live in cities are being lost. In large part, I think it's because some of our urban design tools and theories have lagged in terms of the way that development is currently taking place. Um, a lot of our tools for evaluating and designing cities are based on what I would say is a bifurcated view of cities. 
inside versus outside, public versus private, figure versus ground. We draw city sections, but too often forget to include the activities that support street life. We have more data for modeling, but we forget that the S3 data is based on sorting information as either inside or out. Lost, and I'm picking up Paul Waddell because he's a colleague, lost are the relational conditions that weave parts of cities together. If we are to sustain or even increase the quality of life and legibilities of our cities, we, will, we need alternatives that shift development and design away from only using tall buildings as figures and objects. If we are to make our cities sustainable, both in terms of resources and culture, we need tools, metrics, and technologies that look, let us look at the potentials of weaving contemporary urban fabrics that extend and intensify local place-based identities. So I very much appreciate your presentation earlier. As a quick illustration of the ways in which relations, built, landscape, and urban, can bind and form the experience of cities, I'd like to show just a very it's a very low density project by comparison to everything else that we've seen. There's part of a competition sponsored by the Shanghai Qingfu government for a new canal village. What I'd like to illustrate here is how to read locale and how to extend relational conditions to build contemporary urban fabrics in support of agency, collectivity, scalability, diversity, and legibility and adding to your list, I think. This water village sits in the Yangtze River Delta. To make productive agricultural fields from these flood-prone lands, the region is a system of canals and dikes and levees that control drainage and provide irrigation. The land, of course, is divided into long, thin parcels that radiate perpendicularly from the edges of the canals, from which a distinctive group of towns and villages has grown. As part of an iterative process between design and observation, we began, and I've done this with several groups of students, um, and then with my own office, and the competition is actually done by my office. We began with mapping how this water village was organized and used. It required us moving from the public realm into the collective realm and into the private realm to understand the, an urban fabric and the exchanges between public and private. As design work progressed, we called out the systemic relations in the historic fabric that included from left to right, water, the structural integrals, which are also, because these are one room deep houses, are also the dimensional intervals. intervals. We called out public access, we call a collective access, which is tied to the courtyards and the sunlight penetration into the urban fabric. And um, in the figure on the right, we called out the fact that this urban fabric also has figures or objects. There are the temples, the major pavilions, and pagodas that are highlighted in red on right. Simultaneously, we were diagramming the relations as design parameters. Again, on the top row, we were diagramming the existing conditions with uh, water and the fact that everybody moves back and forth from the water. The dimensional relations, access, which is along the walls, and the sunlight courtyard conditions, which looks mostly like a checkerboard in this one to two story fabric. On the bottom row, you can see the transformation that we began to make. Again, primacy of the water system needs to be maintained because, it, again, we're trying to avoid paving everything over but let the landscape system win. The dimensional system had to be widened because we have now uh, denser, um, larger uh, um, residential sizes that we're trying to accommodate in the fabric. We continue to maintain the access along the party walls. And the most significant change that we made to the urban fabric was to turn the daylight into these north-south bands, 
recognizing that while Chinese like to live in south-facing buildings, uh, to meet the daylight code and to not have wasted outdoor spaces, we needed to reorient the fabric uh, in this north-south direction. These relations were then applied to the competition site as systemic parameters to guide the design. These guidelines describe the open relational conditions as a three-dimensional map. Again, trying to reinforce what John says, the relationship, urban relationship to the ground and to the street as being the most important part of urbanism. This is a different way of describing relational conditions that the figure grand master plan typically hides and bifurcates and tends to flatten urban design. These parameters serve to coordinate the work of numerous actors of the project. We imagine it could be governmental, developers, designers, builders, and residents. In prioritizing the urban fabric, we had an opportunity to rethink the assumptions and potentials of urbanism. First, I think if we build more, we should expect to get more. We should get greater varieties and ways to gather, new scales of building that decrease resource consumption, more variations in kinds of spaces, more diversity of ways of living, more reciprocities between public and private realms. Second, the relational conditions support scalability. Systems operate efficiently at different environmental scales. We need to rethink how to build new and revitalize aging infrastructures at the regional, the district, and neighborhood scales, not just the building scale, which is the favorite scale of an object-oriented urbanism. Third, systems thinking supports agency. By differentiating time frames within systems, we should expect to get greater capacity to accommodate inevitable change. Some components are built to last, others are intended to change with each day, each season, or each occupant. Last, by value, valuing relational conditions, urban continuities reinforce the clarity of legible urbanism in parallel with the diversity of shared identity. Just in case I'm not been clear, this is not a lecture against tall buildings. Please note, we have relatively tall buildings. That, I mean, compared to the ones we're looking at, these are only relatively tall buildings in our urban fabric. They're positioned in ways that augment the public reading of the canals and lanes, located along an infrastructural spine that can support the higher density. So the question I would like to leave you with today is how do tall buildings give back to places? Thank you. to cities that are already fairly dense, um, and for example, San Francisco is certainly a good example, uh, and, and you have a lot of people, you know, kind of moving into the area, the job growth, et cetera, et cetera. How, what, what are your feelings about how best to um, house or office uh, people in, say, San Francisco? Um, interestingly enough, I had an opportunity to work with John looking at the San Market area as part of the Good Design Initiative and um, uh, San Francisco AIA asked me to present to the Planning Commission and the Historic Preservation Commission. And I think it's very much the same thing. Density will happen, but someone has such a unique uh, historical urban fabric with the alleys and lanes that run in between the large blocks. And as we look at how we increase that density, in my mind, how can we actually reinforce those lanes that move through so that they become more and become more characteristic of the south of market? So for me, it's always about looking a little bit larger than the project site that you're working in 
and understanding how any project gives back to the city. So it's not just the tall building, whether it's an infill building, a five block building, a tall building, it's always, it should be doing more than just taking care of itself. It should be sort of net positive, doing a little bit more. I'll just make a couple of comments. First of all, I think it would be very interesting to see you apply your, let's call them rules of horizontality, to something vertical. So even if it was just a hypothetical exercise, I think there are so many things that you're doing here that really are not necessarily horizontal. That's, that's number one. Number two, um, you also, the, the the way you are thinking about cities caused me also to think about rainforests. And I think just as in a rainforest you have this really dense, very active, extraordinarily uh, rich life at the floor of the forest, you have very, very tall trees which when they're spaced appropriately allow light to what's below. So I think that cities can be both. I think that cities can be your very dense carpet of life and these very, very tall trees that are there to support, augment what's going on at the ground. So they're not they're all mutually exclusive, and I don't, I don't think you would ever suggest that. Uh, but it would be very interesting to see you apply your attitudes about horizontal, or horizontality and horizontal life and the scalability of it to vertical situations and also it would be interesting to see you superimpose some dramatically different sized things within your neighborhoods. If it's, if it's of any help, I started in the suburbs with my research on how not to waste the spaces between the single family houses and then I moved to the urban condition to kind of say how is it that we don't end up leaving interstitial spaces in our cities. So I'll try, I'll try that next time. <laughs> I had a question, and this came to my mind also when I heard the earlier talk from uh, Lin Shui Li on transportation systems. Because um, Lin Shui pointed out between these very tall buildings in Shanghai, you know, just getting people between them, there was also quite a few pictures of uh, highways, the mistakes we made here in the U.S. And I wonder if you had any reaction to that on what you've seen or opportunities you've seen for rethinking transportation systems as they affect these developments? Well, so I think John mentioned it already that when you look at the street, you have to recognize the, that streets have depth to them. Um, that you're not, oh, and Jake, Adam Jacobs is a great friend. Uh, his book, Great Streets, documents all these fabulous streets in the world. If you look at his documentation, it stops right at the uh, skin of the buildings. And so he recognizes that the facades are contributing. But if you work in China, you recognize that the depth that goes into courtyards becomes deeper and deeper. If you work with a, a tall building, you have to move in because the sort of density of all the people that are in the high rise are all coming to the street. So streets are more than just skin deep. And so how you start to add them become important. I think China is now already switching relative to transportation, recognizing that the super block is problematic relative to um, continuity at the ground level uh, because it becomes so dominated with streets. So we can see all these transitions happening. Thank you. Thank you.